Good afternoon, Greater Centennial Church family. We thank God for you joining us. Uh, this is normally our Bible study hour, but we're going to do something a little different the next few weeks uh, in the midst of everything that's happening in our nation and around the world. Uh, we need to figure out what we need to do as a church family, as a community, uh, to be able to move into another direction. We can't just uh, sit here and protest and rally and do those things and then nothing else happens. So we have That's to right. talk about what's next. So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity uh, to be here today. We thank you, dear God, for all of those that are viewing and watching us today. We pray, God, that you would be with them and strengthen them today be with each family that's represented here today and God that you would be with our conversation uh, God that you would give us the direction we need uh, to move in another direction that you would get glory out of our lives in Jesus name amen amen uh, Greater Centennial, thank you for joining us today once again uh, in our Bible study time. We're going to do something a little different these next few weeks. You know, we normally shut down Bible study for the summer, but we want to really do something uh, totally different uh, in these next few weeks. A couple of weeks ago, I preached a sermon called, Now What? Now what do we do now? Now that we've protested, now that we've rallied, now that we've rioted, what do we do now? That can't be it. It just can't be the images that we see on TV and then that's it. We can no longer have uh, the stereotype that we'll fight hard, but we won't fight long. We have to make sure that we do what we have to do to make sure that the changes that we need to happen in police brutality, in our communities, uh, social economic status, all of that, we have to begin to talk about what we can do. And so I decided that I would invite a few guests uh, who have been on the front lines, who have been doing some things in the community to have this conversation with us and that maybe we can begin uh, to do some things to move forward. So I've invited Damon Jones to be with us. He's worked with uh, the Fraternal Order of Police. He's uh, one of our civil rights activists. He's always on the front line fighting for justice and fighting for right. Uh, and he is one that I've learned uh, you don't always have to agree with him, but if you listen to them, you'll find some things you will agree about. Uh, because he's always on the side of right. So I've invited him for our first time uh, and our first guest today. And so we're just so happy to have you here Thank with you, us, brother. Damon. And Thank you. <clears throat> really, man, just, just what's next, man? We, we've seen all the images on TV um, across the nation, across the world, right. yes, uh, especially here in the United States for the first time ever. Uh, every, all 50 states had rallies over That's the right. George That's Floyd right. death. Right. Uh, and never seen before. I think we're at a, a different point in history, a That's different right. point in time, even more than the March on Washington. We That's are right. definitely in a different point uh, because now you see people of all colors uh, out uh, protesting and, and, and moving. So, so now what? What do we do now? I, I think, um, first of all, we have to be um, gracious enough to understand that, you know, everything happens for a reason. Um, the COVID locked the, the world down, yeah. right? It took away the distractions, it took away sports, right? We didn't have all those distractions. We couldn't go to the club. We couldn't, <laughs> we couldn't do all the things that we normally do. And in that process, right, we have to see how God works. In that process, we sat and we watched a man being killed for eight minutes and 45 seconds. The whole world watched it, right? So that's, and the result was what we saw, the, the outpour, of uh, frustration, the outpour of anger, um, the outpour for the cry of change. So now that we're crying for change, as black law enforcement, we've been saying a lot of these things for, I've been, I've been on the job for 30 years, and I've watched brothers that came in in the late 60s and the 70s, and I'm saying the same thing that they've been saying, right? We have to have accountability. 
The black community is the only community in the United States that doesn't have a say in how their community is policed. Mm. When we're talking about community policing, we're not just talking about coffee with a cop and, and programs that come out of the police department. We're talking about the community having the say and having the control in the policies and procedures and how it affects their community. That's real community policing, Absolutely. right? It's, it's, it's not all these programs that they come up with. Now they're talking what um, Professor Bell, I mean, um, Professor Jimmy Bell from Jackson State University is the originator of community policing, but it was called extended community policing before they stole it, as, like they stole us, they, they stole right. his program, and they called it community policing. He was saying you have to look at the systems, the systems, and this is what they're doing now. They're saying, well, police shouldn't respond to um, the mentally ill, right? We need to create a system that's going to deal with mentally ill so the police won't respond because the police are not trained to, to respond with the mentally ill. And that's what P Professor Bell was saying. He said, you have to look in the systems of the community and how, and how police respond to these systems. Do you need the police to respond to certain of these systems? No. Because, because they're, they're not trained to do so. That's why we're seeing a high percentage of, of mentally ill people being shot, shot and killed by police because they're not de-escalating the situation. So we have to look at our police department and see what our police department um, needs to change for the community. And, and when we do that, that's real community policing. So we have, to, we have to start off at who they hire, right? We have to start looking at hiring people from the community. See, you can't take, and I'm going to be blunt about it, you can't take a white guy from upstate that never had interactions with black people and put him in the black community. It's not, it's, 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 it's just, not going to work. It's just not going to work. But that's what they do, right? And, and, that's what we, and that's what we see. So we have to start hiring from people in our community, but we also have to have the police management and the municipality understanding that we have to put those people in our community. Sometimes... There's a theory in the culture of policing that police shouldn't be from the community, but that's wrong. Right. They should, they should be from the community. So we also got to address the culture of policing also. So also in the midst of this, we've heard we need to defund the police department. Mm -hmm. We need to defund, defund, defund. Mm -hmm. um, tell me your thoughts on defunding uh, the police department. Um, and, and some are saying, you know, just totally dismantle the police department. Or is it more that we need to look at our police budgets across the nation, in our city, mm -hmm. and say, for instance, Mount Vernon has a $6 million police budget. How is those dollars being spent? Right. And not necessarily cutting those dollars unless right. they're not being spent to Pro bring about the change that needs to happen in our community. Exactly. And, and so when people say defund, I think there's a good and bad thing about that. Right, right. But right. I think it's pr reprioritizing the exactly, that money. exactly. You can't defund the police department. Black people don't police themselves yet, right? And 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 I tell a lot of the activists, you know, until we're able to police ourselves, like other communities police themselves, have have community watch and all that, we can't talk about defunding the police, right? right? Until we're able to do that. So let's let's put that on the shelf. So when we when we're having a conversation about defunding, like you said. Let's look at the budget, right? If you're spending all this money, and, and, and the police are reactionary, right? Because they come when you call. Right. So let's look at how our money's being spent and, and where it's being spent. Now, crime and violence in the black community is, is, is not a criminal, it's more social. So let's look at avenues that we have more social change in how we address the social issues, right? Education, jobs, job training, um, babysitting, reentry, re right, reentry. Um, Washington, D.C. Has a, has a great program called the Office of Returning Citizens, where it's a one-stop shop mm. where they could go. Now, we, we talked about that with the county. They said, well, we got social services. I said, D.C. has social services too, but it's all the need to have an Office of Returning Citizens Absolutely. to address that need. So that we, let's look at where we could cut the budget and open up an office of returning citizens. So when they get out, there's a place they could go, they could get their ID, they could find where, where they could get training, they could find out where they could get housing. If, 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 they're, if they need some type of mental help or any type of social help, they could get all that right there. 
so they don't have to go to this office, that office, this office. With people who office. are sensitive to their needs. Exactly. And then what happens if they don't get that within six months, I give it a little six months, they're back into the life that put them in jail in the first place because they got to eat, they got to feed their family, right? So we have, we have to address that. And so when we're talking defunding the police, like you said, we're talking about looking at places where we're spending extra money that's not needed and putting it in good social services in the communities because that's what we need. Very, and then I just heard you also talk about um, making sure that we have police officers from our community. Yes. How do we, with the culture between our community and the police department being so at odds, mm -hmm. how do we encourage our young men and women in our community of, of, of color, African American men and women, boys and girls, to go into law enforcement? Um, we have to see our black officers being more active, right? That's number one. Um, they, have to see, they have to see us on the front lines. Uh, we can't be silent um, on injustice. Because if we're, if we're silent on injustice, then they don't have, they have, if we're silent, the ones that look like them, then they're not gonna have any faith in the, in, in the system or understand that they could try to make change in the system. Because that's what we say, well, you know, you gotta change it on the inside. But if they don't see those that look like them on the inside screaming for change, right. and then if we're not supporting those on the inside screaming for change, we're not gonna get these young people to be part of that. Um, we, we have to have a, accountability, right? We have to have accountability of those officers because, look, I've been racial profiled, my son's been racial profiled, my daughter's been racial profiled, right? And, I'm, and, and their parents are in law enforcement. Right. So, so we understand that, but we have to have an avenue of, of regress for them in the city. Not one city in Westchester County have a civilian complaint review board. Not Which one. has to change. Exactly. It has to change. Exactly. The, the, the community has to feel comfortable that I can go to a place, make a complaint, my complaint is going to be heard and properly investigated. Exactly. And, and to make sure that the people who are on the Civilian Complaint Review Board are people the community will trust. Exactly. That, that they're going to do the right thing. Right. And exactly. to make sure that, uh, that when this complaint is filed, it can't be, oh, that's just them. And it right. has to say, no, if you file the complaint, we go and investigate exactly. the complaint. And make sure that the police department also cooperates exactly. with the Civilian Complaint Review exactly. Board. Exactly. And, and not hide some of these bad cops and those other things. The other thing is, the last few weeks I've seen um, police uh, promotions in this city and Yonkers and others. And there was nobody that looked like us. How does that tell a young black person that, listen, you can move up in this police department and you can make a career and you can do something good for your community and for your family because you want to have a family, but if you don't think that I can get promoted, exactly. how, how is that, and especially in this climate? <laughs> yes, sir. I know. Especially in this climate. How does that work? It, it, it's, it's hard. You know, um, historically, for those that are watching, um, historically, Mount Vernon is the only... Um, police department in Westchester that ever had a black police commissioner. Um, other than the Department of Corrections, um, Mount Vernon historically always had the highest percentage of black officers than any other police department, historically. Um, so for having a black government and having a um, black mayor, black city council, black controller, and we don't have blacks in charge, um, there's a problem with us. Right, there's a problem, there's, there's a problem, because they do it. Let's, let's, let's not, we call it spade a spade, right? right? They do it, and um, we're in the process now, I've been talking to the county, like, you know, we gotta see a black man in charge. So uh, we have to um, hold our elected officials accountable to put people, qualified people, not just, not right. just, not just, just, not a face. No, we just have, just don't put a, cup, a color in there, we yes. don't want that. Right. Right, because that's so important that that we, you're not just putting somebody in a place to say we have a black person doing exactly. this and really don't have authority or not qualified, because and then when they fail, you say, "See, exactly," and that's what they do to us all the time, right? So we can't fall for that. We want someone that's qualified to do the job and, and qualified to have the con be conscious enough that they want to change the culture of the police department in, in which they're in. 
it's going to be a struggle because we do not network enough. We need community leaders, we need centers to um, give study classes for these people. Yeah. Civil service is all about how high you score on the test. Right. Right? When you, when you go up the ladder, it ain't your, what you know. Right? It's how high you score on that test. White officers, they have study groups. This is what they do. They have study groups and they share study tests and they get high. Black, black officers just go and they just take the test. And it's always an average around, around 70 to the, low, to the lower 80s. We need to make sure that our officers are having study groups. Whether, whether even in the entry exam test, we need to have study groups. When the tests come out, we need to find people and have study, group, study classes so our young people can score high on the test. Because it's just a lucky Sunday. So if you got an officer that scores high on the test, and then that's what the problem is, another problem is our officers are not scoring high enough on the test because we're not pooling our resources and studying together like the white officers do. So the question becomes, so what do we do now as a community? Now mm -hmm. what? You know, how, how do we make sure that some of the changes that needs to happen in our community can happen for our community, mm -hmm. it, whether it's in the police department, whether it's in firefighters, whether it's in mm -hmm. um, how we deal with those who are in our community that may be a little rough around the edges. Right. Now what? What do, what do we do now? Because, you know, the, the protesting is going to stop mm -hmm. after a while. The, the news coverage is going to go away. Now what? We have to force our elected officials to legislate. Um, I've been screaming about an independent special prosecutor since Detective Ridley was killed. And from George Floyd's death, it took him a week to pass it. We've been talking about that, yeah. right? Yeah. So when you, when you put pressure on your elected officials, and it's, elected, and it's election time also, they, they pass the necessary laws. We shouldn't have any excuse about, they're the ones that create the laws. There shouldn't be no excuse why the laws are not, are, are, are not created and the laws are not passed. So if, if we don't have accountability of our police officers, then they're not doing their job. And, and I'll tell everybody that's watching this, your law enforcement officer, no matter what department that he works in, no matter what color he is, he works for you. You are the taxpayer. You pay for that law enforcement officer's training, Depending on what department he works in, you pay for his uniforms, you pay for his benefits, yep. you, you pay for his lifestyle that, that he lives. So if that law enforcement officer comes into your community and violates the policies, procedures, and training, it shouldn't be no less than a crime. So now in Albany, which is nice, they passed the no choke hole, right? But law enforcement, we, we, we learn MMA, mixed martial arts, and all that. So we don't have to use a chokehold to kill you, right? right? So, but it's still a violation of policy. So why not have the law extend to violation of policy, procedure, and training? So when, so when that threshold is meet, it's, it's, it's a crime, not just a chokehold. We, we gotta cover everything. And also, our elected officials have to negotiate the union's collective bargaining agreements, mm. which that, what, what people don't understand, that's the union has a contract with the city, right. in which they get their raises, right? Put measures of accountability in that. They have, they have uh, what they call the duty to intercede, meaning that if, 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 if I'm a cop and I see you doing something wrong. You're supposed to stop. It's my obligation to stop you, and if you're violating policy and procedure, put cuffs on you if I think it's a crime. That needs to be not only in policy, it should be in the contract. Yeah, yeah. And if they don't do it, then you know what? Don't give them a raise. You have some officers that work for police departments that the city have paid out for three, four million dollars, and they still get promoted. How does that happen? See, we, we have to be- we, So we have to be more cognizant exactly. of what's happening with our police departments, exactly. and they have to be more transparent of what's exactly. happening with the officers. So as you know, 58 was repealed, governor signed it. And that's great. So tell those who are watching, first of all, what 50A is and why it's so good that that was repealed. So, so 50A, when it's a law that kept the public from seeing the work history 
of a of, of an officer. So if you're um, going into a lawsuit or if you're going to criminal court, you can't see the work history of that officer if that officer had a pattern and practice of doing what he did to you. So now you're able to see the work history, whether he had write-ups, complaints, if he was a good officer, the bad officer. You, you're, the public's able to see it. You can foil it and you can see it. I work for the Department of Corrections. I tell people, look, I've done nothing wrong. I've been there for 30 years. They could take, they could take, my, they could take my jacket. So if, you, if you're a good officer and you're following policy, procedure, and training, you shouldn't have a problem. But the ones that scream and foul are the ones that probably have something to hide in their jacket. But what that also does too, it holds management accountability. Mm -hmm. Because how did this guy get promoted with all these write-ups and, right. and, and, and complaints? Right. You know, like, like the George Floyd incident, this guy was an FTO. He was training two officers that was on the job, not even... And he had 18 write-ups himself. Exactly. So these guys were just at the wrong place. <laughs> At the, the new ones. I'm, right. I'm, just, I'm just talking about the ones the new that was ones. on the job four days. Exactly, exactly. And, and a lot of people, see, you got to understand the culture. I got 30 years. Someone with four days ain't telling me what to do. Right. It, it just, it's, just, it's just not happening. Even if I'm doing wrong, you still can't tell. They, they're not going they, they to tell them. They, they're not going to tell them what to do. So usually officers get in trouble like that because. They are scared to tell that senior officer what to do. Uh, we had an incident in, in, in Westchester County Jail where a guy was found hung. The senior officer didn't do the job, but the, but the junior officer, was, the guy was only on six months, he got fired, right? So, but, the, but the senior officer got union representation and they were able to keep their job. Right. So, so we know how this happens. So we, we have to, have a proper way that we um, evaluate our officers. When, when Detective Ridley was killed, Westchester County had a use of force task force where they made um, certain recommendations. One of the key recommendations was, was evaluating and having a good pro evaluating process of your field training officer. Because when that officer comes out of the academy, that field training officer is, is giving them the, do, the do's and don'ts. But what happens is, when you get in and, and, and you get that old field training officer that's been around and ain't nobody say nothing, right. the first thing he tell you, whatever you learn in academy, forget, forget it. about it. Right, right, right. <laughs> forget we, about we it. We don't do that here. Right, right, I'm gonna show you how to do the job. <laughs> this is the right way right, to do it. Right, right, and, 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 and that's what probably happened with Floyd. And you know? because that's how somebody trained him. Exactly. You know. Exactly. Exactly. Last question before we go. Um, how do we help make sure there's a national database f that tracks bad cops, that they can't go from department to department to department, bringing the same behavior to different cities? Um, you, you, you have to make sure you pressure your, your, um, your government, um, your U.S. elected officials. But also, you need to write your county and ZEC, write your county legislators, because they could do that here, right? We, we, we've seen um, bad ones leave one police department and just slip into another. So um, we need our county elected officials also, and our state. But, but, but everything starts local. So you make sure that your local government don't take the bad ones. And then you make sure that the county has a say right. has a policy we're not going to do it and then you make sure the state make sure it doesn't happen in the state so so we have to start off local and work our way up that was great so um thank y'all for watching today um just wanted to have these conversations about now what what do we do now um and so what we've learned now is we have to pressure our elected elected officials to do the right thing make sure there's transparency begin to talk to our young people about becoming police officers and, and training and all of those other things so they can keep their record clean now. Exactly. So when they get ready to apply and get ready to take the test, um, they won't have anything holding them back. And so we really, really have to do that. Um, and we wanna make sure that um, each of you know what, what we can do now, right now, is early voting. You can go out and vote. 
and vote for people who you believe are going to be able to prosecute bad cops because we have our DA up for That's elections. Right. So you got to make sure That's that right. you're going to make sure that somebody is going to look at the community, as I said on Sunday at a rally, um, that we want to elect people that's just not going to come in our city when it's time to be elected, but is going to be fighting for our city wherever they go, to Albany, to Washington, wherever they got to go, but they're fighting for your city or fighting for our city, Mount Vernon. Pastor, so, let me, I mm -hmm. just want to mention, everybody that's listening, we, we, especially here at Mount Vernon, we've heard the stories. We've seen the news reports of, of, of what's going on and homicides not being investigated and, and um, corrupt police officers and uh, everything. And the district attorney in, in this last three years have not done anything. So when you go to your voting booth, you have to, you have to ask yourself, do you want to go through this again? Yep. Do you want to go down this same road again where you are being violated as a community by those who sworn to protect you, whether it's an elected official or a police officer or, or, or whatever person that has sworn to protect you and there's nothing done by your district attorney's office. You have to ask yourself that when you go into this. I'm not telling you who to vote for, but I'm telling you, <laughs> you got to ask yourself that, are you going to go down this three years again? Right. Because if you are, or if you don't, you got to make the change. If you want to, then go with the same old, same old. And also remember that, you know, George Floyd can happen right here in the city of Mount Vernon. We already saw the young lady who was pushed into the cell and hit her face on, on the concrete wall by a police officer. And yes, he was finally arrested. But well, you had three. You had three. You had the uh, Raynette Turner. Yep. You had the girl pushed. And you got the mentally ill guy that, yep. that, that was shot by the supervisor that cost the city $3 million. Why was he on the street? There you go. So <laughs> it happens here. It happens here. When I saw that video of that young lady being pushed, I was just disgusted. And it took that long for him to be arrested because initially, supposedly, allegedly, the DA wasn't going to charge it. Exactly. And then George Floyd happened, and then, and then all of a sudden they found the tape. <laughs> exactly. And now all of a sudden, so this is what our votes do, that we want to make sure that we're going to vote for people who are going to take care of our citizens and take care of this community. So you can definitely go out and vote. If you have a question for us, you can absolutely ask it right now uh, as we get ready to wrap up today. Um, we're going, like I said, for the next few weeks, we're going to do this now what? Just ask the question. As I said before, a couple weeks ago, I preached a sermon and said, now what? What do we do now? We've rioted, we've looted, we've, we've protested, we've rallied. Now what? What do we do now? That can't be it. That can't be the goal of just making sure that we get on CNN and have an interview or whatever. No, it has to be more than that. It has to be change that's going to be lasting and sustaining change that makes it for everybody in our community uh, absolutely better. So once again, I want to thank Damon Jones for you, uh, stopping by and having this conversation. I thought he would be an excellent person to have this first conversation with, with his knowledge of policing and, and the African-American community. Next week, uh, the Reverend Dr. Uh, Ed Mulrain is going to be here uh, and talk to us about about now what and some different angles of how we do that and we're going to have some others come and begin to, to push us into now what because we just can't the Lord has called us to be the church but we can't just be the church in here we have to go out and mobilize and do what we have to do uh, so we can make our community because we're not making our communities better we're not much of a church and so we have to make sure that we're doing what we need to do um, so uh, we thank God for you um, uh, how can the church support as a congregation? Uh, we're going to be talking about these things. We've compiled some things now, uh, changing the culture, filing complaint, begin to talk to our young people about becoming law enforcement officers yes. and having them see it as a career, having them see it as a career that they can rise and all those, those other Absolutely. things uh, in, in the department, become commissioner, become chief, become whatever they want. Corrections, you only need a GED. So there you go. Correction. You can make over one hundred and ten thousand dollars a year having a GED, having a GED, and have and have great benefits. I'm telling you, I've been doing it for three years, thirty years. So we need to take these tests. Right. We need to we need to take these tests and protect your community. What 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 better way to protect your community 
than becoming a police officer. Absolutely. Well, if there's, no, there's no better way than protecting your community than, than being in law enforcement and, 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 giving, and giving back to your community and, and being that, uh, that black man and black woman that people would look up to. And, and, you, and you help your people. You, you, you help your people through that service. Um, so, you know, and, and you make good money. I, I, don't, I don't understand. I, I really don't, I don't, I don't understand yeah, why. That stigma. Yeah, we have, to, we have to change it. That stigma, and I believe we, we that have to has to change. change. And, it, and it starts with our young people, getting them uh, to look at law enforcement different and, mm -hmm. and getting them to see themselves as a change. Exactly. As they go exactly. into law, law enforcement. Uh, the question is, how do we get the work history of a DA? So how, how do we get the work history or the prosecution? prosecution record of the DA. Um, I think That's it's very, public record. Yeah, yeah well, it's, it's public record. It's probably if they'll, if they'll give it to you. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that's it. Yeah, they'll give it to you. But, I mean, just Google, Google your district attorney and see yeah. what comes up and, and you know, um, and, 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 see, and see what comes up. And I believe that'll, that'll definitely help. And so uh, we want to help. We want to make sure that some of these changes happen. We want to make sure that every one of our communities, that each of the officers have body cams. That's right. And that there's some regulations for those body cams that when they become, when they come in encounter with somebody, they have to turn it on. It's That's not right. a, a judgment call whether I want to turn it on or not. No, you never know how a situation is going to escalate, that that officer has to have a body cam on. Uh, I'm not sure if all the officers in Mount Vernon have body cams. I know some do, some don't. But we need to make sure every officer in whatever city, whatever municipality, the county, wherever, they have those body cams because sometimes that's the only thing that's going to tell the real story. And so we got to make sure that's on, we got to make sure that's working, uh, and making sure that we're doing what we need to do in that. So we want to thank you once again. Oh, can we get a local... Can we get a local hosted panel of potential candidates up for election of DA and judges? Um, I don't know if we have the time yeah, to do tight. that um, because the election, uh, the last day of elections is June 23rd. Early voting ends June 21st. Um, so people are already voting um, in that election. Um, yeah, it, it may be. And with this COVID-19, there would have already been, uh, you would have already heard from them. Uh, especially from the church and from other places, um, but you can definitely, um, once again, Google who's running. If you have any questions, uh, we can definitely help you with some of that. How can the community help create study groups to help our officers to perform well on the civil service exams? Good question. That is a good question. They, some of it is they have to do, you know, they know themselves. They know each other. They are in this every day. And so they have to make sure that they well, can. Well, for the, um, ini the initial exam mm -hmm. for the community. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we could do that. I we mean, can we, definitely we could get that. somebody to come and, and they, could, they could have test material and, and classes. I mean, that's, I think that's, that's a great way to, to start. Absolutely, I, I think. But as once they become an officer, right? They got to get together they themselves. They got to get together <laughs> themselves. But initially, I, I right. think that's a great idea yeah. that we can get some young people who want to be police officers, mm. want to take the exam. We can definitely get somebody yeah. to help you study for that exam. That's yeah. easy. Yeah. We can get that done. So. Uh, once again, we want to thank you all for joining us and watching us. Share this with somebody. Share it on your page. Uh, let somebody know this was some great information today. Uh, we're going to keep talking about now what? Because, uh, yes, we're going to go out and rally some more and we're going to protest some more. Uh, but we got to do something more than that to make sure this change is everlasting and systemic. So once again, uh, thank you, Damon thank Jones, you, for joining Appreciate us. You. Thank all of you for watching us. Let's pray. Thank Father, you. thank you for this great day that you've given to us. Thank you for this great conversation. Uh, Lord, continue to guide our feet and guide our minds and our hearts and our spirits um, to do what is right for our community. So God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you bless everyone under the sound of my voice, uh, that you would heal, that you would deliver, that you would set free all those who need to be set free. So God, I pray that you would touch our uh, essential workers, police officers, firefighters, grocery store workers, all of them, God. Be with them and just continue to keep us all safe, dear God. Lord, don't let us let our guards down simply because the weather is getting nice. 
that COVID-19 is still out there. And God, we want to still protect ourselves and our family members. So Lord, thank you for this time we've had to share. Bless us now in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Once again, thank you. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you Sunday, 930 right here at greatercentennial.org.